Stayallday.com. Now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques on underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called work on your game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is, we are in part two of our, or what will be a four-part series on how to change. And uh, before we get into that, I remind you all of two things. First of all, my daily motivation and Monday motivation messages, guaranteed to have you focus sharp and on point to start your day or your week, respectively. All you got to do to get that is be a member of my texting community. It's free to join. Just text me at my number, 305 384 and once we start sending those messages again, we reactivate, you'll be getting that message straight to your phone. Secondly, work on your game. University, that is the place where I do all my coaching. You want to have me as your direct coach, you want to get access to all of our trainings, all of our courses, all of our programs around the concepts of mindset and everything underneath it. Strategy, systems, accountability, implementation, action, performance, consistency, and producing results, and all the subtopics underneath each one of those. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. And on top of all that, you have me as your direct coach. Work on your game, university.com. Link is down below in the description. With that out of the way, let's get into the topic here today, which is part two of our four part series How to Change. Number four, get supporting elements around you. Supporting elements can be in the form of actual people. They can be books, it can be audio, it can be courses, they can be groups you're a part of, uh, photographs, videos, anything that supports the change that you are looking to make and reinforces it to you on a consistent basis to you and for you on a consistent basis you want to have those elements around you why because remember you're going up against however much time that you have been the previous version the person you're trying to change from is going up against this new version that you're looking to implement and you need to overwhelm the old version with images and ideas and energies of the new version so the more things you can get on your side Piling everything on one side of the scale for the new version, the better, so that you can overwhelm the old version. What usually happens with people, and the reason that they may begin to initiate change but don't follow through on it, is because the exact opposite happens in that they don't get enough supporting elements around them for the new version, and therefore the new version gets overwhelmed and overcome by the old version pushing back against the new version that you're looking to implement. Because again, the inertia fights back, your emotions fight back, your mindset fights back, the people you're around fight back, your environments fight back, your memories of the past, all of those things are fighting back against this new version that you're trying to create because again, the law of inertia, it is harder to change than it is to stay the same. So staying the same fights back against any change that you look to implement and the longer you've been one way, the harder it's going to fight back when you try to change it. This is the reason why it is so difficult for people to get off a, a drug habit or to kick alcohol or to any type of addiction that someone has, the reason that they have to go through a whole process, they have to get away from where they were before, and it can be a very painful experience for them, mentally, emotionally, and even physically, and they have what we call withdrawal symptoms. Any of you have ever, has ever withdrawn from something, there's a, there are symptoms that come from that withdrawal, and those are physical pains, there are mental, there are mental, mental pains, and there are emotional pains, because your previous self is fighting against any change that you are trying to implement. And the reason many people don't change is because they don't want to go through that pain or they want to go through the pain, but they don't have the proper strategies or systems in place to deal with the pain. This is the reason why you shouldn't try to do this by yourself. This is the reason why people who are getting off of drugs go to the meetings. All right, this is the reason why people who are in rehab go to rehab. All right, you go to rehab. All right, you don't think about rehab. You don't listen to rehab. You go to rehab. You physically remove yourself from the old place and you go to the other place. Right? Isn't that how it works? Okay. Same thing you need to do. You need to physically be going to doing things and looking at and seeing and experiencing things that support the new version to fight against the pullback of the old version. And if you want to really make change, you need these things that will reinforce it for you on a consistent basis, especially when you're trying to go through a change of, again, undoing years of a previous type of programming or a previous habit. And the habit is a form of programming. So if you're talking five, 10, 20 years of something. And you're going up against it with a much shorter period. You just got the idea of last week. All right, you really think that's going to happen that easy? It's not going to go that easy, it, depending on what we're changing here, by the way. Depending on what you're changing, it could be harder or easier. But it ain't going to be easy, just super easy, especially when you're trying to undo something that you have been for a long time. It's not always an easy road. And 
this is why you need to enroll supporting elements in helping you in this process. This is the reason why people hire trainers, coaches, join masterminds, have physical therapists, go to group meetings, uh, go to uh, retreats, join uh, uh, rehab and 12-step programs. They do this for this specific reason. And guess what? Those things work. They work. The exact purpose is supporting you in your shift from where you were or are to where you are going. Trying to do everything on your own is generally a failing strategy because human beings, we all have a couple of limitations in that we eventually run out of time and or we run out of talent. There's only so much you are capable of doing and there's only so much you can do no matter how capable you are. Therefore, when you enroll and enlist other people in helping you in your process, you are much more likely to achieve the outcome, assuming that those people are actually capable and useful and they bring something to the table. That's an assumption. I'm assuming that you get the right people around you. When you enroll other people, you're, better, you're more likely to achieve your outcome. So every time a person tells me that they're going to keep trying to do something on their own, they, I know that what's going to happen is they're likely going to fail. That's usually what happens when people try to do things on their own, especially when they keep trying to do something they, they have already proven that they can't do well, they usually end up failing. That's usually what happens. And in my experience, uh, this happens over and over and over again with people simply because um, it could be several reasons. It could be a fear of enrolling other people in a process. You just don't want other people involved in the process for whatever reason. There are many reasons why people do this. It could be an arrogance that I can just figure everything out on my own. It could be a discomfort with having other people involved in your process because you know that you may be telling yourself some lies and some bullshit that another person who is astute can see the bullshit and they'll see right through it and they'll call you out on the bullshit and therefore force you to make a change that you've been hesitating to make. So therefore, people just say, I want to do it on my own because doing things on your own and doing things at your own pace usually means doing things to keep you in your comfort zone. That's usually what it means. When someone tells me they want to keep doing things on their own, that usually means in some way, shape or form, they just want to remain in their comfort zone and they don't want anyone to push them out of it. The problem with that is 10 years are going to go by, you're still going to be in the same spot. And if you're already having a conversation about making change, we know that you don't want to be in the same spot. But again, there's this this push, this push pull between you wanting to change and you want and your willingness to deal with the discomfort that comes with that change. Which one's going to win? That's the question. Point number five. Today's topic, once again, is how to change. We're in a four part series this is part two. Number five, the identity shift. This is what happens when you make a real change in your being. This is what happens. When you start to make a real change in who you're being, and this is the important change, which is the change in the being, not the change in doing, but being, your identity changes. You shift from seeing yourself as a certain type of person and start seeing yourself as a different type of person. This is where the supporting elements help, because when you get the supporting elements of being around other people, well, you're going to start conducting yourself and thinking and talking and acting like those people. So who are you hanging around? If you're an alcoholic and you go to the bar every day, you hang around a bunch of other functioning alcoholics or non-functioning alcoholics, well, your identity is going to soon become similar to theirs because we know the law of association. You become the average of the people you spend the most time with. If instead you start hanging around people who never drink, don't touch alcohol, and don't even consider themselves to be a drinker, period, your identity will eventually shift to being like theirs as long as you stay around. As long as you stay around, your identity will shift to being like that. Hang around a bunch of people with money, your identity will shift. You hang around a bunch of broke people, your identity will shift. You hang around people who work out every day. Like everybody see where I'm going with this, right? Okay. So what are the supporting elements you have around you? When you make a real change in your being, you start seeing yourself as a different type of person. Forget about the actions. You see yourself as a different type of person. So if I say that I'm a businessman, well, what actions do I need to take to match the identity that I have assumed for myself? I need to be doing business. I don't know what kind of business, but I got to do some kind of business because that's what businessmen do, right? If I say I'm an athlete, what am I going to do? I'm going to do whatever athletes do. All right? Even if I'm not that smart of a person, I think any of us could pretty much figure what does an athlete do? An athlete probably goes to the gym. Let me go to the gym, see what's happening in there. Businessman does business. All right, where can I do business? All right? Even if you don't know a lot, even if you're not the most intelligent person on the planet, you could figure out directionally what you probably should be doing given the identity that you have taken on. And again, if you had the right supporting elements around you, and in the world that we live in today, folks, don't worry about this part about what am I going to do now that I've shifted my identity because the what do I do part is actually the easiest part of this equation. What do I do is the easiest part of this equation, even though many people treat it as if it's the hardest part of the equation. It's actually the easiest part 
because most people, <clears throat> again, the information, what to do, how to do it, or ways you could do it is a better way of saying it. It's not even what to do, but things you could do is so readily available, uh, you're drowning in information. That's not your challenge. Your challenge isn't what to do. You know how I many people are out here telling you what to do when it comes to a certain outcome? Uh, millions, uh, maybe not millions, let's say thousands. You got plenty of options. It's the identity shift is the part that you need, and that's the part that most people are not talking about. When you see yourself, for example, as a person who takes care of their body and their health, well, going to the gym is a natural byproduct of that identity, right? When you see yourself as someone who publishes articles every day, then sitting down and writing every day is a natural next step that supports that identity. When you see yourself as a person who doesn't smoke, doesn't do drugs, and don't smoke, you don't do drugs. All right? Not hanging with your friends who smoke and do drugs is a natural next decision that supports that identity. See, when you take on a certain identity, there are certain natural next steps that come with those identities that you can immediately take on right now. And this is how the being leads to the doing. So you don't have to focus on the doing, just focus on the being, because the being will immediately show you exactly what direction to look in. Because the being, what it also does, and we talked about this before we got into the series, I talked about making decisions and making demands of yourself in an episode on you get what you accept, is that when you shift your being, it cuts off everything that is not commensurate with that being. See, if I say I'm an athlete who takes care of my body and I'm always in great shape, well, it cuts off things like eating ice cream every day or sitting around doing nothing or sleeping in and missing my workout. See, none of those things go along with that identity. So if I truly believe in that identity, there's no way I'm not waking up at five in the morning and going to the gym. It's not happening. It's impossible. But that to occur because my identity says I work out. If yeah, my identity says I'm not a drinker, then I'm not going to hang it in the bar with people who are drinking beer for three hours because it doesn't match my identity. See, when that identity shift is real and you really believe in that identity, it's who you are. You don't have to believe in it. You just know it's just who you are. Then the actions are automatic and the non-actions are automatic as well. See, the things that you don't do automatically come with the things that you are doing. If I say I'm not a drinker, then it doesn't mean I can't go in the bar, but I'm not ordering a drink. And if someone offers me one, I'm not taking it. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not asking them what it is. I'm not, I'm saying, no, I don't drink. That's my answer. I don't drink. And most people will respect that. Now, if you say, eh, eh, sometimes, what is it? Eh, what kind of beer is that? Or what kind of alcohol? Eh, maybe. Eh, eh. All right. So now you haven't shifted your identity yet. This is why many people who focus on actions instead of identity fail because they're using an inaccurate formula of what I need to do instead of asking who I need to be. Now, if you can get this part right here, it'll start pointing you in the right direction of everything else. Even if you don't know what the, everything else is, it'll point, it'll have you looking in that direction. You might not know exactly what to look at, but you're looking in the right way, at least. Are you looking for a sunset? You should at least be turned to the west. Or you might not see it, but at least you're looking in the right direction. You're not looking east, trying to find a sunset. You're never going to see it. Point number six. Today's topic, once again, is how to change. We're on part two of our four-part series. Number six. Understanding your locus of control. Locus of control is about understanding what influence and control you have over certain aspects of life and then taking full control over those aspects once you identify what they are. Human beings control each one of you. You control about 1% of everything that occurs in your life. So everything that's happening in your life, about 1% of it is under your control. 99% of it is out of your control. And the 1% that you control is based on, it's based in the way that you think, that 1%. Based on how you see yourself, how you choose to respond to events, and what actions you decide to take based on these things. Your thoughts, the way you see stuff, what happens in your life, and you know, let's just say those three things. Your thoughts, the way you see stuff, what happens in your life, and how you see yourself. All your actions will be based on that. And the more control you take over that 1%, the more you will feel like and it will appear that you have influence over the 99%. You don't really control the 99%. You don't really have a say over the 99%, but you actually do. You don't, but you do. You don't in that you can't just say it and it happens most of the time. But when you take more control over the 1%, you start to influence everything else around you. And again, as the saying goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. The more you use something, actually, it creates more of the same thing. All right? And this is the law of association. Anything that you are associating with, you create more of it. This doesn't just apply to a people. The law of association applies to everything. 
law of association applies, uh, association, excuse me, applies to energy and power and influence the same way it applies to people. What I mean is if you associate yourself mentally with having energy, with being powerful and having influence over yourself, guess what? That association starts to spread to everything you touch. And now you start to have influence and power and a say over other things that are not really in your direct control, but it starts to feel as if they are. And other people notice that it looks like this person was like controlling everything. This person's just running everything. You ever seen somebody and just seem like everything they said and everything they wanted, it just happened the way they wanted it to happen? That's because they were using the law of association. And most of those people may not even know what they're doing. Some people know what they're doing. They're doing it intentionally. But many people don't even know that they're doing it, even when they have this power. They don't realize this. They haven't broken it down the way that I broke it down. Good news for you is now you understand it. So now you're responsible for it. Now you can do something with it. So you can influence the 99% that is not really under your direct control, but it will really, really feel as if it is because you're influencing it. You're not making it happen. You're influencing it to happen. And that kind of feels like you're making it, but you're really not. This is how some people can seem to have control over a whole lot of stuff, even though they had the same 1% that you got. And that is, this is true what I'm telling you here. Every human being on the planet has control over control, meaning they can literally decide and do it right there on the spot excuse me, control over 1% of what happens in life. 1%, that's it. No more than that. No one has more than 1%. But there are people out there who it seems like they control like 80% or 60% or 90% or 75%. And why is this? Because of what I just explained to you. The more you exercise it with the 1% you have, the more you get. Again, you use it or you lose it. If you, the more you use it, the more control you get. And the less you use it, the less control you have. That's how it happens. To the point that some of you have so uh, conditioned yourself to not take control over the things you do have control over that it seems like you can't even control that. Have any of you ever felt like you couldn't even control yourself? Like how I'm not even able to control my own thoughts. I can't even control my own actions. The reason this, happening, this is happening is because you've gone so long not doing it that the world just said, okay, well, let us take control of it. All right, that's not what you want. A bulletproof mindset framework inside of Work On Your Game University, we solve this problem immediately. It's the first thing you do when you join the university is go to Bulletproof Mindset. See, these people who seem to be controlling everything, they just have a different approach to their 1% than you have to your 1%. But they do not have more than 1%. And no matter how much power they have, money, attention, and whatever you want to call it, followers on social media, nobody ever gets more than 1%. It's just how much the 1% can influence everything else. That's the difference between people. But nobody ever has more than 1%. Okay, so I'm giving you the formula. All you got to do is use it. So let's recap. We're in part two of our four-part series, How to Change. Number four, get supporting elements around you. Books, people, audio, courses, groups, photos, videos, anything that supports the new version that you are looking to step into, which leads to number five, the identity shift. When you shift your identity into this is the type of person that I am, you don't have to think about whether or not you're going to do something that does not, that does not jibe with that identity. When your identity is clear, you are making a decision, you're making a demand, you're cutting off every other option other than things that connect with that identity. When this identity shift becomes real, then the actions become easy to understand and they flow naturally from this identity. Number six, understanding your locus of control. This is about understanding the control that you have over what aspects of life and it never is more than 1%. No human being ever has more than 1% more than control directly over things that happen in life. And the more control you take over that 1%, the more influence it appears that you have over the remaining 99%. These are, this is how people who appear to be super powerful are doing it. They just seem to have control over everything else because they've taken so much control over the 1%. This is an identity. The challenge with this is many of these people who do this don't even realize what they're doing. They cannot explain it nearly as uh, in detail in a way as I've explained it. So this is how you can look at them and see what I'm saying, but they couldn't give you this explanation the way that I can give it to you. But the reason, that's the reason why I'm here. That's the reason I explain this stuff. So you can do the exact same thing. All you gotta do is follow their formula and I'm giving it to you right here. So make sure you text me so you're in my community and work on your game university. You wanna learn how to put this stuff in the real life action for your personal and professional life, go to workonyourgameuniversity.com, get my direct help in the process. Work on your game. Dre, all.